بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته There are so many stories in the seerah in the biography of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام that if we were not sure of its authenticity we would have said that it's a myth it cannot be true the Prophet والسلام, when he instructed and permitted his companions to migrate from Mecca to Medina to flee the oppression and to be able to worship Allah Azza wa Jal in security and safety when the companions reached Medina, they actually sacrificed everything they had. They had to flee their houses, their tribes. They left their wives behind. They left their children who refused to revert to Islam. They left their wealth, or should I say they were forced to leave their wealth. They deprived them from everything they had so they migrated to Medina with nothing except their clothes they were wearing when they reached Medina the Prophet ﷺ sought or the Prophet ﷺ gave the instructions that each and every one from Mecca should be taken by one of the people of Medina, the Ansar, to be his brother. And this is one of the greatest aspects of Islam, sharing the wealth, the wealth with the needy. Therefore, the Prophet ﷺ gave every Muhajir from Mecca to one of the Ansar from Medina as brothers. And at that time, if any one of them died, the other one inherited him, as if he was really his brother from his flesh and blood. Now, one of the top ten best companions of the Prophet ﷺ was Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. May Allah be pleased with him. And he was among the very first to embrace Islam in Mecca. He migrated the first migration to Abyssinia and came back and then was allowed to migrate again to Medina. The Prophet ﷺ appointed Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah, may Allah be pleased with him, to be his brother. So the pledge was made and Abdurrahman ibn Auf now has a new brother. This brotherhood, it was not outlined in the sense that you have to do this and that. It was sufficient and enough for the companions to know that this particular individual is your brother and you should care for him. It was enough for them to know that to do wonders and what we consider nowadays to be miracles. Sa'd ibn Rabi'a, may Allah be pleased with him, went to Abdurrahman ibn Auf and bluntly gave him an offer that no one of us could refuse. He gave him a proposal. He said, Abdul Rahman, my people in Medina know that I am among the richest of them. So here is half of what I have for you. And I have two wives. Choose one you like. I'll divorce her afterwards. And after the waiting period is over, you can propose and marry her if you wish. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, may Allah be pleased with him, said, May Allah bless your family and your wealth. I have no need for that. Show me where the market is. Do you have a marketplace here? So Sa'ad said, yes. We have the market of the tribes of the Jews called Bani Qaynuqa. So 
Abd al-Rahman ibn Auf went there and he got some dry milk and some ghee and he started trading bit by bit until he could afford to marry and he came to the Prophet sallallahu with signs looking on him that he had just married and the Prophet told him sallam, did you get married and he said yes so the Prophet asked him who did you get married to and he told him that I married a woman from the Ansar from Medina and he told him what dowry did you give her then Abd al-Rahman said it's the weight the equivalent of a date's seed in gold something that is negligible nowadays so the Prophet said والسلام, sacrifice a sheep and call your companions to this dinner or this walima if we sit back for a while and look at this story to tell you the truth I was shocked when I read this story for the first time it's an authentic hadith but it sounded like it happened on a different planet and let's analyze this bit by bit and you will understand why I was shocked now when the Prophet said والسلام, and appointed Abdurrahman to be the brother of Sa'd ibn Rabi' that was it he did not elaborate on what to do and what not to do and by the way Sa'd is a very beautiful name that a lot of the Muslims nowadays ignore I don't hear a lot of the Muslims calling their sons Sa'd and if you look at the companions of the Prophet والسلام, you will find a great deal of the companions with the name of Sa'd such as Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas one of the ten best companions of the Prophet Sa'd ibn Mu'adh the head of the tribe of Aus one of the greatest and strongest companions of the Prophet Sa'd ibn Abadah the leader of the tribe of Khazraj in Medina and Sa'd ibn Malik also one of the companions and great narrators of hadith of the Prophet and of course Sa'd ibn Rabi and so many others so this is a great name if you have a son and you would like to call him a beautiful name with a beautiful history Sa'd is the name now Sa'd went out of his way to prove his faith and Iman by sharing what he had by being a real brother to Abdul Rahman ibn Auf he went to Abdul Rahman and he did not tell him Abdul Rahman I have some money he did not tell him I have money he did not look for excuses by telling him I'm rich but you know I have debts on me and I've lost of my money in the stock market I did this and I did that and I'm building a house and I'm engaged in so many projects he did not put any excuses forward to block any hopes that his brother had unfortunately it is, isn't this how we treat and behave with our fellow Muslims they have different souls than ours their Iman and belief in Allah is far stronger than ours he did not offer to give Abdurrahman ibn Auf a lump sum a fixed amount of money he told him this is half of what I own and have in this world and it's not a small half people by nature are stingy and they do a lot of bad things and the more they get the blessings of Allah the stingier they get if a boy in college gets his pocket money of this much it's easy for him to pay someone who's in need pay a beggar to pay a poor person all of that 
He has no problem with that. If a person has a thousand euros in his pocket, it's easy for him to give 10 euros or 50 euros away, and sometimes 100 euros, which is 10% of what he owns. But if he had 100,000 in his bank account, 10,000 is a lot of money. If he had a million, 100,000 is a lot of money. And the more you have, the less you spend. With the companions of Allah, it was a different story. Sa'ad bin Rabia said, this is my wealth. I'm a very rich person. Take half of it. It's yours. Compare this with us. We have lots of relatives that we don't care or cater for. Our own brothers. I've seen so many families with rich brothers and very, very poor ones. And the rich never help the poor. And if they do, they help them with peanuts, nothing. And yet, they always nag about this and say, I did this for you and I did that for you. As if they're stabbing them on and on and hacking them with the few things that they gave them. It did not affect them at all. But what forced Sa'ad to do this to a complete stranger off of him? He's a complete stranger to him. Why did Sa'ad do this? Because he was his brother in Islam. It is his faith and belief that makes him do something like that. It is his belief that forces him? No. That pushes him to realize that you should look at your objective. We're all headed to our objective, and that is paradise. So, through the process, this doesn't mean a thing at all. If money comes and goes, I have no problem with that. But what I'm looking for is paradise, and I am on my way to that place. Therefore, everything is is negligible other than my objective. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah we will be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. So actually Saad was not wasting his money. He was not throwing his money left, right and center. On the contrary, he's very smart. He was investing his money so it would be multiplied not in this life but on the hereafter he was utilizing his assets and if we look at those who are considered to be rich among us nowadays we notice that they've lost their hereafter for this never lasting life they've utilized their wealth and money as if they're not going to die at all. They kept it, they preserved it, and they counted every penny of it without spending it in the sight of Allah or to those who are needy. They, in accordance to commercial laws and regulations, did not invest their money. Actually, they froze their money. How is that, you may ask? Let's analyze. A billionaire who has a fleet of cars, a hundred cars for example, how many cars is he going to utilize? He will only be able to ride one car at a time. And when he makes or throws a dinner party with all the nice and lucrative food he puts on the table, a hundred chicken from all types in all kinds of cuisine how many chickens do you reckon he could eat one more than one he could not utilize the rest so if he had utilized his wealth it would have been better for him in this life on and also in the hereafter and that is why the Prophet tells us alayhi salatu wasalam, 
the sons of Adam, a son of Adam, any human being, says, my money, my wealth, my money. And Allah tells him, you have nothing of your money except what you eat and digest. And what you wear and it's worn off. And what you spend in the means of charity and give to the poor. This is your money. Other than that, it's either for your inheritance after you pass away or for the government when they take the taxes or for a robber to come and steal your money off of you. This is actually your wealth. And if our wealthy people look at their money in this way, they would have utilized their money and they would have been worthy of being envied by people. Our Prophet ﷺ told us that it is not lawful to envy someone else except two types of people. One of them, a man, Allah bless him with a lot of money. Yet he's utilizing this money in the sake of Allah. He's paying it right and left to the poor and the needy. This person, you may envy him in the sense that, I wish I was like him. And the other man is a person Allah gave him knowledge, gave him information and wisdom from the Quran and from the Sunnah. And what did he do with that? He utilized it by acting in accordance to the Quran and Sunnah and teaching the Muslims, telling them and showing them the beauty of Islam and guiding them in this life. This man, you also can envy him in the sense that I wish I was like this man. And look at the second offer of Sa'ad. The money bit is easy. But Sa'ad told him, I have two wives. Choose one. And the one you chose, I shall divorce her. And after the waiting period is over and she can marry whoever she wants, you can propose and marry her. I have no problem with that. To tell you the truth, when I read this for the first time, I said, wow, Sa'ad is one heck of a man. He surely found the easy way out. I thought that probably he didn't like both his wives, so he just wanted to get rid of them and said, this is an easy way. And if I were in his place, I would have probably said, listen, choose one and I'll give you the other one free. Take both of them. I don't want them. I thought this was the case, but definitely it's not. Sa'ad was a great companion of the Prophet Sa'ad was an Arab. And in Arabia, it's a disgrace for anyone to look at your wife. They love and cherish their wives. They are so jealous to the extent that before Islam came, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, who was one of the dignitaries of Medina and the head of the tribe of Khazraj, of Ansar, he was known before Islam to be so jealous to the extent that if he had divorced a woman, no one from the tribes around him would dare and marry her. She is divorced. She is let alone because if someone married her after the divorce, Sa'ad is so jealous that he might kill him. Of course, after Islam, this does not exist anymore because if you divorce a woman, she has all the right to marry whomever she wants. If you want to keep her, then don't divorce her. So, Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah, when he gave this offer to Abdurrahman ibn Auf, he didn't want to get rid of his wives. He loved his wives. So Sa'ad, may Allah be pleased with him, loved his wives. He cherished them, but he decided to let all that go. He decided to sacrifice his love for the sake of Allah and to please Allah the Almighty. He offered one of his wives to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. It wasn't easy. It is, it's never easy. But when you do this for the sake of Allah, you tend to find the satisfaction coming out of that.
The companions of the Prophet ﷺ knew that those among you best to their wives are the best at the side of Allah, the Almighty. Yet he chose one of the best companions of the Prophet ﷺ to take his place with one of his wives. And that is why he chose the best to his wife and this is how we should choose the best for our daughters from among us and not to give our daughters away to the rich or famous we should choose the closest to Allah Azza wa Jal among them now if you look at what Sa'ad offered Abdurrahman you would say that this is astonishing no one can do this well actually if you look at Abdurrahman's position, you would say that it is even better. The offer of Sa'ad was unbelievable. Half of his wealth in one of his wives. But the answer of Abdurrahman was, May Allah bless your family and your wealth. I have no need for that. If it were any of us, we would have immediately said, Okay, I'm cool with that. I'll take whatever you give. As long as it's a, free, a freebie, I'll take it. It's for free. No obligations, no strings attached. But Abdurrahman was a man of dignity and honor. He did not accept burdening his brother, though he knew that he's doing it out of goodwill. And he had the dignity not to beg or ask, though the offer came free of charge. He said, instead, may Allah bless your children, bless your wives, bless your wealth. Show me where the market is. I'm a strong man. I'm a healthy man. I seek the support of Allah. I have my full dependence on Allah. And I'll go and look for work on my own. Show me where the market is. And so he did. And day after day, he used to go there. He had this dry milk and some ghee. Something that is worthless. He sold it and he bought something else. And with a very narrow mar margin of profit, he sold it again and borrowed another thing and kept on doing this until, mashallah, he had a capital. And this capital helped him to marry one from the Ansar women. And so he did and went to the Prophet, والسلام, who told him, what did you do? Did you get married? And he asked him about whom he married from. And he prayed for him and said, may Allah bless your marriage. This is a lesson not to be looked at easily. We should have our brotherhood among us. We should look for our brothers who are poor or needy. And we also have to have the dignity and the pride not to beg and not to ask. And if something is offered to us and we are in deep need of it, take it. But do not beg and do not ask. May Allah Azza wa grant us this brotherhood in this life and on the hereafter until we meet next time في امان الله والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته